sentiment could get in his way. No wonder in 1958 he took on himself the enormous task of serving the people of northern Ghana, particularly Tamale and other communities, at a time that most of his compatriots were very unwilling to sacrifice to serve inside the private areas of the country. He became a living testimony to many and inspired many doctors to take up challenging tasks of serving in the northern part of Ghana. He was a true definition of a mentor. Dr. Evans often served the medical profession and the country with distinction in various capacities. He was a surgeon's surgeon, a trainer of doctors, a teacher, an excellent medical administrator. He impacted positively on a lot of medical professionals, both home and abroad. Countless doctors were tutored by this great academician and medical professional. It was therefore not a surprise when he was appointed Vice Chancellor of the then University of Science and Technology Kumasi, now KNUSC, in 1967, a position he served in till 1973. It was also during his tenure as a labor union leader and through his foresight that the very blueprint as to how the Ghana Medical Association will run for decades to come was developed. Dr. Evans Anfum was a trailblazer. During our preparation towards the 60th anniversary celebration of the GMA in 2018, he granted an exclusive interview to the association where he revealed that he joined the profession out of love for human beings and their welfare. He was passionate about providing service to rural communities. He therefore urged younger doctors to accept posting to such communities. He recounted how when he accepted posting to Tamale after his training, a friend told him, Tamale is far, and he responded, far from where? Dr. Emmanuel Evans Anfam served humanity, academia, his nation, and above all, his patients and the medical profession with dedication, diligence, excellence, and passion. His book titled The Testy Land, Autobiography of a Patriot, summarizes his patriotism to his nation. The GMA has indeed lost a great stalwart and a true icon. A heart of gold has stopped beating, two shining eyes at rest. As doctors, we must carry on not just the love and commitment Dr. Emmanuel Evans Afum had for medical practice and teaching, but the spirit with which he did same. As we pay our last respect to the giant, this giant of the noble medical profession, we pray that the good Lord will receive his gentle soul and grant him eternal rest. Fair thee well, past president and fellow of the GMA. The GMA still believes you live on. I equal gentle giant. Dr. Evans Anfum, rest in perfect peace. Tribute by the Medical and Dental Council. Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book that they were engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God. Job 19, 23 to 27. Dr. Emmanuel Evans Anfum, centenarian, educationist, surgeon, statesman, and sportsman. On the occasion of your transition from mortality to immortality, we at the Medical and Dental Council join the country, your family, and friends to celebrate you today for your lifetime achievements and service to God and country. Our senior most colleague graduated from the prestigious University of Edinburgh in 1947 as a medical doctor following his secondary education at Achimata College. He later qualified as a surgeon with the celebrated Royal College of Surgeons of Edinburgh. He returned home in 1950 and worked in all the existing regions at the time except Volta region. For him, 
No part of the country was too far away. He also helped in the teaching of anatomy at the then fledgling Ghana Medical School, now the University of Ghana Medical School. Our senior most colleague was the president of the Ghana Medical Association from 1968 to 1972, the president of the West African College of Surgeons from 1969 to 1971, and the second chairman of the Medical and Dental Council from 1979 to 1984. He was elected a fellow of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences in 1971 and became its president from 1986 to 1990. He played a significant role in the founding of the African Academy of Sciences and was unanimously elected chairman of the West African Examinations Council in 1991 for a three-year His contribution to the development of our country, the Presbyterian Church and Society has been recognized before. In 1973, he was awarded a Doctor of Science Honoris Causa degree by Salford University in Greater Manchester and was later honored with the Edinburgh University Alumnus of the Year Award in 1990. Dr. Evans Anfum was awarded member of the Order of the Star of Ghana in 2006, and we were privileged to honor him for his outstanding contribution to the development of Ghana at a special induction ceremony held on Friday, September 13, 2019, just before he turned Right. Dr. Emmanuel Evans Anfum, senior most colleague, you persevered against all odds in very challenging times to achieve manifest in the fields of medicine, tertiary education, sports nation building and in the service of your Christian beliefs. Sir, you became a key member of the noble and truly learned profession of medicine. But your service with integrity to humanity, to the profession and to our country through outstanding leadership and tenacity of purpose are even nobler and remain unmatchable. We join the country today, your family, colleagues, and friends to celebrate you and to say simply thank you, Chairman. Your unparalleled service has been engraved on a rock with an iron pen and lead forever. Rest well, sir, till we meet at our Redeemer's feet. Amen. Tribute by the West African College of Surgeons. Dr. Evans Anform was a foundation member of the West African College of Surgeons and an icon who also served Ghana in many ways. His experiences working throughout the country Give him the vision and commitment to ensure the growth and development of human resources in surgery. 
not only in Ghana, but across the whole of the West African sub-region. We are very proud to say that through his contribution and service to the college, the college now boasts of nearly 7,000 surgeons, both in Franco. Anglophone, Lusophone, and other countries across the sub region. The late Dr. Evans Anform was elected the fifth president of the West African College of Surgeons in 1969. And he remained passionate about the college and was anxious to see it grow and become well established. The college is now 61 years old and growing stronger by the day. He's the longest serving past president of the college. He's an inspiration to all of us. The entire body and fellows of the West African College of Surgeons celebrate him. We pray that God gives his family the strength and fortitude in these difficult times. Fare thee well. Fellow West African College of Surgeons, Dr. Evans Anform, may you rest in perfect peace. Thank you.
are graduating from the end of the process. And at this time, I invite the police to leave. And then we invite the government officials to do the final pass. This is followed by the Supreme Court justice. Council of State members ask the awaiting the Department of Justice. We are gradually getting to the end of the pre-burial service. 
And at this time, I invite the police band to play. And then we'll invite government. officials that are around to do the filing pass. It will be followed by the Supreme Court Justice, Council of State Members, as we await the coming of the President. Police band, please take over. You took your responsibilities as head of the W.T. Evans family seriously, and you loved family. No matter the circumstances, you were there to solve all the family counselor to all. You were welcoming and genuinely pleased to see us when we visited you. You always displaced you, sorry, you always displayed an in-depth knowledge of the family history and ensured we all had copies of all the important documents. Our patriarch, we thank you for all you did for us and we will do our best to emulate you. We thank the Lord for bringing such an incredible uncle into our family. We will cherish your memory in our hearts. You deserve everlasting rest in the bosom of the good Lord you served so well. Uncle Lima, Uncle Doctor, Daddy, Yawajubara, God with you till we meet again. Amen. A tribute to my father-in-law by Henry Badu. In old age, they still produce fruit. They are always green and full of sap. Psalm 92, verse 14. At our wedding, I commented during my speech that Dr. Evans Amphon was someone I had always admired and that I felt very proud to, be, to have him as my father-in-law. Since then, this admiration for him continued and even strengthened as I came to learn more about his many achievements, not only in the medical field, but in other areas such as sports, education, his talent in art, his commitment to the Presbyterian Church, his love of music, as well as having been Vice Chancellor of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. He had a very sharp mind and his memory was phenomenal. He could remember the names and initials of several members of staff that had been at Achimuta School, both the teaching and non-teaching staff. Even during the last few, years, few months of his life, we could rely on his memory to be correct. If he said a particular person was visiting on a particular day, we found that he was invariably correct. Daddy, as we called him, was very generous. He gave our family so much, and I often jokingly told Rachel, my wife, that once a daughter, always a daughter. He also encouraged his family and the wider sphere of those he interacted with to make full use of their potential and strive to do well in their chosen field of endeavor. He loved Ghana, 
and was really hurt whenever things in the country were not going well. We really miss him, but we thank, God, we thank the Lord that he lived a full life. Daddy, rest peacefully in the arms of the Lord. Good morning to all. My tribute is rather too long, and so I have summarized it, and this is a summary of what I have in the brochure. Living with Daddy as a daughter-in-law exposed me to another side of his life. Daddy led a very simple but strict life at home. He was pleasant, had a sense of humor, but would scold in love if you gave him the chance to do so. He was always ready for a good chat. He remembered everything, everyone, and all his dates. He remained in charge of his household till his last day. Thank you, Daddy, for all you imparted to me. May his angels lead you to paradise, and may you rest peacefully in the bosom of the Lord. <laughs> Weep not for me, though I have gone into the gentle night. Grieve, if you will, but not for long. Upon my soul's sweet flight, I am at peace. My soul is at rest. There is no need for tears, for with love, with your love, I was so blessed. For all those many years, there is no pain, I suffer not. The fear is now all gone. Put now these things out of your thoughts. In your memory, I live on. Remember not my fight for breath. Remember not my strife. Please do not dwell on my death, but celebrate my life. Daddy, yao Japan. I am the most recent addition to the Evans Anthem family. I'm from a tiny island in the Caribbean known as St. Vincent and the Grenadines. Total population 110,000. So you know it's real small. I joined 
in the Evans Anthem family in 1996. And I finally got to meet Daddy when he visited us in Atlanta in 1998. Prior to my first visit to Ghana, uh, I came for his 80th birthday. I immediately felt at ease with him and got to enjoy his wit and wisdom. I regularly got to speak with him when Neokai called home and occasionally we spoke with him independently. And during one of our conversation, I was having trouble with the connection on my phone. And I was saying, hello, 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 and he wasn't hearing me. Finally, you know, I apologized and I said, I'm so sorry that the phone isn't working. So I turned to Nukai and he was chuckling. He says, Daddy was chuckling at the phone, not working. And Daddy replied that it was not the phone, but us, since we were of the BBC generation. And I asked, well, what's he talking about? What's the BBC generation? And uh, he said, you should ask my father, he'll tell you. And I said, Daddy, what's this BBC generation? And he says, BBC means we were born before computers, so they can't expect us to know very much about them. Uh, I found that he did have a sense of humor. And uh, there was also a serious and a reflected side of him. I was sitting by his bed uh, a few years ago when I came to visit, and we were talking about my job as a hospice nurse for the past 25 years and the end of life discussion that I usually have with, with my patients. And he said he had very few regrets in his life, but one of them was that he wondered if he should have, uh, have more things to leave for his children. And he said, uh, I, I feel sad that maybe I didn't have enough things to give. But I said, Daddy, you gave your family the best. Your integrity, love for family, love for country. All that is evident even now in the lives of your children, your grandchildren, and will also be reflected in your great grandchildren. This was a blessing for me to spend time with this gentle and special man and I would always remember him and miss him. Daddy, may you rest in eternal peace. Tribute from Leonora, Siobhan, and Ruth. It feels really strange to talk about Grandpa in the past tense. It is still so surreal that he's no longer here with us. And with each passing day, this realization sinks in more and more. He has always been a very significant figure in our lives. His home was our second home, and life will just not be the same without him. Each time our parents were out of town, we would go and stay at Leonora Lodge, which we affectionately called LL. Before traveling, we would pass by LL, and upon arrival in Accra, LL would be our first stop. Grandpa was so kind, generous, and had a great sense of humor. It was always a joy being around him. He had a sweet tooth and would always have chocolates in his fridge which he would offer us along with a drink any time we visited. He would also ask if we had read the newspapers and would proceed to offer them to us. Grandpa really wanted to instill the discipline of reading in us. When Accra Mall opened, he gave all his grandchildren money to go and buy a book of their own. And when we were in boarding school, 
en route back to SOS HGIC, we would stop at Grandpa's house and he would give us pocket money. Grandpa decided that when any of his grandchildren turned 13, he would take them out for a Chinese meal. And true to his word, we went to a Chinese restaurant for everyone's 13th birthday. Indeed, family was his priority, and he had the welfare of each member, whether nuclear or extended, at heart. He never missed an opportunity to take a family photo with his children, grandchildren, and great-grandchildren. Each Christmas was spent with the extended family at LL, and he always gave us Piccadilly Gem Biscuits. Each October 7th, his birthday, was an important day, which was celebrated in grand style. It will really be strange to celebrate Christmas without Grandpa. His presence was commanding and exuded dignity. He was a man of principle and discipline, and yet always had a twinkle in his eye and in his smile. God used him in many distinguished family, volunteer, professional, and national roles, earning him the respect, admiration, and goodwill of many, both home and abroad. He visited many countries and received many dignitaries in these roles. We were always so proud to be the Evans and from Nabi. To his grandchildren, he was just a typical grandpa who doted on his grandchildren. He was extremely humble and never blew his own horn. He was such a selfless individual who took an interest in and always wanted us to excel in all our endeavors. In his later years, when he could no longer go out much, his words of wisdom on all manner of topics, ranging from marriage advice to matters of national development, were passed down through informal chats, a few words after Christmas lunch and his own birthday speeches. Grandpa's memory was so sharp till the very end. He could recollect so many things in great detail. For instance, he could give you the exact details of photos taken more than 30 years ago. Grandpa was God-fearing. Grandpa lived such a full, long life. Indeed, he lived. It will be strange passing by LL and visiting, knowing that he is no longer there. He will be sorely missed, and his legacy will live on. Tribute to my grandpa by Maya. You can shed tears that he is gone, or you can smile because he has lived. You can close your eyes and pray that he will come back, or you can open your eyes and see all that he has left your left your heart can be empty because you can't see him. Or you can be full of the love that you shared. You can turn your back on tomorrow and live yesterday, or you can be happy for tomorrow because of yesterday. You can remember him and only that he is gone, or you can cherish his memory and let it live on. You can cry and close your mind, be empty and turn your back, or you can do what he would want. Smile, open your eyes, love, and go on. A tribute from CJ, Daryl, Leone, and myself, Juliana. We are so grateful for the life of our grandfather. It is truly a blessing to be the grandchildren of such an honorable, legendary man. He was always a happy, loving, and caring man who couldn't contain his excitement when we spent time together. To be the product of such an inspirational person is beyond an honor. Even though we were far apart, every time we connected, it was as if he never skipped a beat. Hearing him tell stories was such a treat. His sharp mind and attention to detail made you feel as if you were there experiencing it along with him. One of our most cherished memories of our grandpa is simply just traveling across Ghana and seeing all of the areas where he grew up, taught, and built his legacy. His story has touched souls around the world and has made a huge impact in the world. His philosophy of learning a skill or trade overseas, returning to Ghana and rebuilding still remains relevant to this day. 
His expertise in the medical field has influenced generations upon generations, and especially one of our very own. He always encouraged us to be great and assured us that hard work truly does pay off. He lived life by the golden rule, treat others how you want to be treated. He was a man of many accolades, yet he remained humble. He set the bar high for us Evans and Foms. Ghana was lucky, lucky to have him, and we are so, and so were we. Grandpa, rest in peace. Tribute from Mina, Loretta, and Emmanuel. When we were younger, Grandpa would always make sure he had our favorite foods and drinks. As we grew older, he would let us help him arrange his documents in various files for safekeeping. We would then go through various photo albums ranging from his days in school through to, through to the pinnacle of his career. With every photo, with every photo, he remembered the events of that day so vividly and we listened in awe. It brought out the storytelling part of him, along with nuggets of wisdom to help us in our individual lives. It was great to see the world through the eyes of someone who had lived through some of the biggest inventions, the telephone, the TV, the mobile phone, and the internet. Grandpa wanted to keep up with the world. He had his own smartphone, a whole Samsung Galaxy S9, and had a Facebook and Gmail account. One of our favorite memories is when he got overwhelmed with Facebook requests and asked, them, and asked us to let them know that he accepted all their friendship requests and was humbled and honored to be their friends. Our visits were filled with technology lessons and becoming his personal assistant by typing any letters and tributes he has, typed on his personal laptop and printed on his personal printer. Grandpa, we will miss you. We will miss your sense of humor and your adorable smile. Rest in perfect peace, legend. Good morning. I'm here to read a tribute on behalf of the Henkel and Associated families, relatives of the widow, Auntie Liz. Whenever we think of you, Dr. Emmanuel Evans Amform, we think of strength, kindness, wisdom, kind counsel, and compassion. You showed all these attributes to us and all the people you, who came into your orbit. It's with a heavy heart that we attempt to eulogize you for you live such an amazing life. And as we mourn you, we know that the world is empty without you. We will never forget you. We cannot replace you with anyone else, but we thank God for the gift of memories. Because of memories, we will always have you in our hearts and minds. Um, a few messages from your brother-in-law, Luther Henkel. He says, you have been blessed with a long, full life and you have achieved so much, making you the envy of most mortals. You are a good man, and a good man is hard to find in the world today. From your nephew, Victor Hassan, my heart is heavy with grief as I write this. I'm hit with the realization that I will never hear your voice again. Talking about my late dad and mom, whom you brought to life for me always. I will never forget your kindness, and the respect you show to everyone you met. You always exuded such peace. May the peace that passes all understanding now swathe you for all eternity. Your nieces and nephews, Ajua, Kwesi Kwami, and Ikria Kwatin. What can we say about Papa Doc? We are not even sure when we started calling you Papa Doc, but you have been that to all of us for the longest while. You were scary, smart, a rudite welcoming and always interested in what we were doing in our personal and professional lives. You were funny, you had a dry, almost wicked sense of humor, warm hands. We always remember that. A gentleman, always a strong presence in the background. It's hard to imagine driving through Ringway without you being there. 
you'll be greatly missed. Rest peacefully, Papa Doc. Your niece, Bridget Nontra, my dearest Papa Doc, you are one of the most caring, loving, and compassionate people I've ever known. My fondest memory of you is our inside joke of robbing a bank because of your avant-garde sunglasses. Seeing you a week before the Lord called you is an absolute highlight for me as I stay comforted by the fond memories of you. May your good works inspire us all to be a blessing to others. May the Lord keep you resting in perfect peace. Your niece, Mami Sewa Safwaje, dear Papa Doc, although I didn't visit you very often, I, I enjoyed every visit with you. You were interested in what was going on in my life, and you kept me thoroughly engaged each time. I would get your messages through Auntie Elise, and I would oblige with much pleasure, appearing with a shepherd's pie and piece of roasted leg of pork, which you loved to have me make. For me, it was, a, it was special and created a special bond. Writing this brings a harsh realization that I will never see you again. I will never get to kiss your cheek again, but you will not be forgotten. Rest well, dear Papa Doc, with all my love. Your sister-in-law, Aphrodite. Dear Papa Doc, thank you for allowing me to serve you, especially this last year, where you enjoyed light soup made with chicken wings and other delicacies. I was always honored when I had the opportunity to cook for you, and I'm very sad that I will not have the pleasure of doing so again. I'll think of you always and I'll miss you. I'll miss your laughter and jokes and above all, I'll miss your presence, just knowing that you are there. Rest in perfect peace, dear Papa Doc. And for me, Selma, I say your life was indeed remarkable and blessed. I remember the quiet talks we had and how I love to hear stories of your life, your travels in different parts of Ghana and abroad. You have left us now to join the blessed ones who are beyond the reach of pain and sorrow. So today we bury only your body. All our memories of you will be engraved in our hearts and minds forever. And I conclude by saying that we in the family have so much to say, but even if we speak for days, we'll not be able to say it all. And I would like to say to Papa Doc, your name will be spoken by generations yet unborn. We who are blessed enough to be on this earth at the same time with you will see to that. Rest in peace.
will now continue and ask police band to continue the interlude.
I invite the rich church choir to continue. <laughs> now is the President of the Republic, His Excellency Nanadu Dankwa Ekufuado. Shall we be upstanding?
Can you please be seated? The clergy will fantastic. life after death because there is a glorious resurrection it is because of this divine act that we hope that Dr. Emmanuel Evans Amphon is going to the arms of Jesus. You were a gift, not only to the church community, but to the global community. And Lord, we thank you that you gave him again as a gift to us. We hope that you will rest in your bosom. 
remember him always, but the shortcomings do not remember. Remember the dear wife, dear children, the rest of the family. And Lord, we hope that at the eschaton, we will come and meet him together with our Lord. Thank you for his life and thank you for this occasion. May he be an example to all of us by the power of the Holy Spirit. And in Jesus' name, Amen. Amen. Go in peace. May the Holy Lord hold your hands and take you safely home until we see each other again. The Lord bless you. Bless your body, soul, and spirit, and keep you safe now and evermore. Amen.
of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Spirit be with you all. Amen. Beloved, we are here to give thanks to God for the life of Emmanuel Evans Anthem. We are here grieving that a life has ended, but rejoicing that life eternal has just begun for him. Let us all listen to words of scripture. Let us listen to the sermon tributes and bring our pain and sadness in worship to God. Let us receive the comfort that God longs to give to his people. The scripture says, the souls of the righteous are in the hands of God, and there shall no come and touch them. They are in peace. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Let us worship God. The hymn is through all the changing scenes of life. conqueror of death, someone we have loved has died, someone who is so special to us, precious and irreplaceable. We know, God, that no words we can say at this moment can express our feelings. No words can take our sorrow away from us. And this is why we have assembled here this morning to bring to you our grief and pain the emptiness, loneliness, and despair. You are help in time of trouble. In the presence of death, you comfort those who mourn. So, Lord, we bow before you, believing 
that you bear our grief and share in our sense of loss. Draw near to us, O God, as we draw near to you. Speak to us through the words of Scripture, through our prayers, through all that we are here to share, so that believing in the gospel and trusting in Jesus Christ, we may receive the comfort, peace, and strength that you long to give to us. Let us find hope in this life, but especially in the life to come. Through the merits and through the reputation of Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. The mass choir will lead us to sing Yesu Kawuhu. I'm a few of 
Our scripture reading is taken from Psalm 90, verses 1 to 12. Psalm 90, verses 1 to 12. Let us hear the word of God. Lord, you have been our dwelling place throughout all generations. Before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the earth and the world, from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. You turn men back to dust, saying, Return to dust, O sons of men. For a thousand years in your sight are like a day that has just gone by, or like a watch in the night. You sweep men away in the sleep of death. They are like the new grass of the morning. Though in the morning it springs up new, by evening it is dry and withered. We are consumed by your anger and terrified by your indignation. You have set our iniquities before you, our secret sins in the light of your presence. All our days pass away under your wrath. We finish our years with a moan. The length of our days is 70 years, or 80 if we have the strength. Yet their span is but trouble and sorrow, for they quickly pass and we fly away. Who knows the power of your anger, for your wrath is as great as the fear that is due to you. Teach us to number our days aright, that we may gain a heart of wisdom. This is the end of the scripture reading. Thanks be to God. Before we listen to the biography to be read by Ni Okai Evans Amphom, let us stand to sing the guy hymn, Mi Jelo Jimmy Leleche, Eda Ni Ehewa, to be found on page 99, page 99.
it is quite impossible to give an adequate life history of a life of 101 years in the one the time allotted and it's even inadequate what the 10 or 12 page life history we have here I will I, but please by all means do read it because you'll get a better insight into the man who was Dr. Emmanuel Evans Anfong. What I'm going to do is summarize uh, his, I guess, the milestones in his life. And um, what I'm going to do is summarize the milestones in his life and um, try and limit it to my allotted time. Emmanuel Evans Anfong was born on October 7th, 1919 at the Evans family house in Jamestown, Accra. He was the son of William Kwashi Anfom and Mary Emma Anfom, née Evans. His early years were spent mainly in the family house on High Street, but occasionally he would go and visit his grandfather, William Timothy Anfom, William Timothy Evans in Mampong. And that was a source of great joy to him. He started school in 1925 at the Government Junior Boys School in Jamestown. In 1930, he entered the legendary Osu Salem and was there for five years before he went, entered Achimota School. He was there until he, he graduated in the 1938 year group, but the following year he was awarded a Gold Coast scholarship to go and study medicine in Edinburgh, but he couldn't go because of the war, so he joined the staff at Achimota School for three years. And in 1942, he did set sail for Edinburgh, a journey fraught with danger, but he made it and started his medical course in 1942. He graduated in 1947. And while at Edinburgh, apart from excelling in his medical studies, he also excelled at hockey. And he was captain of the Scottish University's 11 for two years. In 1947, he finished his uh, medical course and worked for two years in the United Kingdom before coming back to the Gold Coast. In that time, he met an African-American lady, ironically called Leonora Evans. And a few years later, in 1952, they got married when he was back in the Gold Coast. Now, I would just like to uh, summarize some of the uh, achievements of his career and life uh, under various uh, headings that we say. So let's talk about his medical career. He graduated from Edinburgh University, like I said, in 1947 and returned to the Gold Coast. After completing his housemanship, he was posted around the country to several district hospitals, Accra, Kumasi, Dunkwa, Tamale, and Second D. He was in charge of the surgical department of Kumasi Central Hospital, then the largest in West Africa. He was also a foundation staff member of the Ghana Medical School, a past president and fellow of the Ghana Medical Association, a president of the Ghana Medical Association, yes, uh, President of the West African College of Surgeons, and also the Chairman of the Medical and Dental Council. He sort of like switched careers a bit into education in 1967 and became Vice Chancellor of KNUST in Kumasi. He served a six and a half year term from August the 1st, 1967, to December 31st, 1973. He succeeded in uniting a hitherto 
polarized community and made the institution more relevant to the community, i.e. bringing the gown to the town. His emphasis was on service, research, and teaching and he was instrumental in setting up the Technology Consultancy Center, which was copied by several other universities. He was also instrumental with the late Professor Alote in establishing the computer science course in the university. He introduced matriculation and several other innovations which are still in existence. He introduced faculty and departmental links with other universities, which are still in existence. On his leaving office, it was observed that he left the university in peace and not in pieces. After leaving the university in 1974, he moved to the National Council for Higher Education. The council was the chief advisor to the government on all matters relating to tertiary education. He had frequent audience with the then head of state and was able to po influence policy positively. He also used that access to fight for and secure the land that currently houses the national hockey pitch. As you know, hockey was his passion. He was chairman of the West African Exams Council from 1991 to 1994. He was nominated by the government of Ghana and elected chairman by the council for that three-year term. In that time, he consolidated the establishment of the council's own printing press in Nigeria called Megavons. In the 80s, he was chairman of the National Education Commission for three years. He dealt with educational issues at all levels and drew up the guidelines for the implementation of the junior and senior secondary schools and other reforms. He also gave the definition for basic education which is still in use today. He also chaired the National Consultative Committee on Education Finance. He was also a member of the Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. I say member, he was actually a fellow. And he was elected in 1986 for a four-year term as president. It was a dangerous time as the academy was seen to be in opposition to the then PNDC government. He saw the institution safely through and working with the late Professor Alote, took the academy on the continental and international stage with some Ghanaians becoming founding fellows of the African Academy of Sciences based in Nairobi and the Third World Academy of Sciences based in Trieste. Church activities. He was a staunch Presbyterian and has been member of the Osu Church since 1934 when he was at Osu Salem. He was also president of the Ghana Boys Brigade. He was chairman of the Interchurch and Ecumenical Relations Council of the Presbyterian Church of Ghana and represented them at many international conferences. He was first chairman of the board of the Akrofi Christella Institute for Mission Research and Applied Theology and he served for 15 years and raised it to an international standard now affiliated to the University of Ghana and the University of Natal. The Institute can now award its own degrees. As I said before, hockey was his passion and he is known as one of the fathers of hockey in Ghana. He popularized the game wherever he went in the country, especially in the secondary schools. He was captain of Edinburgh University 11 and Scottish Universities 11. He founded the Gold Coast Hockey Association and was its first chairman. He played competitive hockey from 1935 to 1962, and he was captain of the Ghana national side for four years. He led the national side to win the Africa Hockey Championship in Cairo in 1974 as chairman of the Ghana Hockey Association. 
He was honored by the Sports Writers Association of Ghana as a past hero. He was given a special citation by the President of Ghana on his 96th birthday. And uh, here are a few of the honors he won during his life. He was a member of the Council of State of the Third Republic. He was awarded an honorary DSC from the University of Salford in 1974. He was honored an honorary Doctor of Literature from the Akrofi Christella Institute. He also got an honorary DSC from KNUSD Kumasi, which he had previously been Vice Chancellor of. In 1996, the University of Edinburgh made him their Alumnus of the Year, an award which is made to an alumnus who has made an outstanding contribution to the development of his home country. At a special ceremony and award in September 2019, he was honored by the Ghana Medical and Dental Council as a patriot and icon of the medical profession. He is also a recipient of the highest national honor, a member of the Order of the Star of Ghana. Sadly, in early 2021, his health began to deteriorate, and the family realized that the great heart did not have that much longer to beat. On the morning of April 6, 2021, he was administered communion as he was fading fast. In the evening, the family gathered round and we all sang some of his favorite Ga and English hymns, interspersed with Bible verses, and it was quite spontaneous. At the end, he lifted up his hands and clapped for fully 10 seconds. On the following morning, April 7, 2021, at the age of 101 years, and six months exactly, he quietly slipped away. We shall stand to sing the next hymn, My Faith Has Found a Resting Place. It's on page 99. We shall sing the first, the fourth, and the fifth stanzas only. The first, fourth, and fifth stanzas only.
listen to the first set of tributes. In the following order, please. The widow, the children, and the Presbyterian Church of Ghana. Good morning. I'm Mariam Henko. I read this tribute on behalf of my grandmother, Mrs. Elise Evans Anfong, a widow's farewell song. Remembering you, my beloved husband, for your calm and friendly disposition, which made it easy to approach you, for your wit and easy humor, which made it a joy to be in your company, for your deep wisdom and good counsel which stirred me towards peace and conformity, and for your forte which gave me a broad shoulder to cry on. You were gentle but sensitive. You had an inner strength and an ordered disposition which calmed the often raging storms I had to deal with. You were so many things. I have even heard people refer to you as an institution. Someone may ask how and where I met such an extraordinary man. I first met you, beloved husband, in a hospital in Tamale, to where you had been transferred under great protest because you thought Tamale was too far. But too far from where was your boss's reaction? Too far from attending to the sick and suffering, instead of having a good rest at home, you listened to the voice of selflessness to help the needy and disregarded the voice of self-centeredness. Among the many people who needed medical attention in those days in Tamale was a young returnee teacher who, having lived in the UK for four years, had lost some of her immunity to malaria and had a very severe attack of the illness. That young teacher was me. I had come to Tamale to visit family and friends when I suddenly became very ill. You were the doctor who restored me to sound health. Even now, I remember those days, long before I knew you would become my husband. I remember the pain I felt and the wretchedness of being ill and how you looked after me with such gentleness and empathy. I became well again, not so much because of the drugs, but because of the skill, knowledge, and compassion you treated me with. This attitude of self-centeredness characterized your life's journey. You are indeed people-centered, and your concern for others was one of the many qualities you exhibited throughout your remarkable life. Decades later, Circumstances brought us together and we got married. During the last 37 years of marriage, you have been a steadfast pillar and comfort to me. For that, I thank you and I thank the Lord for crossing our path in this life. I love you not so much because of material things, but because of the spirit which generated them. In other words, the spirit of God which moves you and controls you and makes you humble in spite of your many achievements. I cannot help but see all you have achieved in the light of the word, which says, God works in all things together for good to them that love him and are called according to his purpose. My dearest, as new opportunities opened up for you, and sometimes you had to travel out of Ghana, you journeyed to all those places with me. You always wanted me close by you, you have been incredibly loyal and loving, generous and patient. Thank you for all those blessings. One of our travels was when we went to Edinburgh for you to receive the Alumnus of the Year 1996 award bestowed by your alma mater, the University of Edinburgh. The citation they presented to you listed many achievements. However, what struck me was when you, in 1960, 
Under the auspices of the United Nations, led a team of Ghanaian doctors to the Congo to help rebuild the health care delivery system of a sister African country. As chairman of West African Examination Council, WAIC, we visited all the African members' countries. On our trip to Japan, we, met by, we were met by a foreign service officer who happened to be one of your many past students strewn all over the world. We were in pool in the UK when Richard gave you your first grandchild and I became grandmother extraordinaire. We were, so, we were so happy together and in spite of some of the skirmishes, we found joy. I remember that when you were president of the Boys Brigade, we traveled to Singapore for a Boys Brigade conference. On the trip, one of the windows of our plane developed a crack in mid-air. We had to land at the nearest airport, which was in Bombay, India. We spent a whole day there, waiting for the window to be fixed. We were blissfully oblivious to the danger we had been in, and just enjoyed the sight and sound of a great city. Naturally, some of our travels took us to the U.S. to visit New Okai and Chale and their families. Back in Ghana, our home was quite often a hive of activity, what with birthday parties to plan, preparation for weddings and engagements, and visits from family and friends, always with the wonderful help of Niteko and his family. The light always shone brightly, for our home was indeed joyful, especially with the addition of grandchildren and more recently, great-grandchildren. Thanks to your wit, you are able to make even a dull situation lively. We were happy even when illness struck and disturbed the outer peace we felt. Our joy was still so strong because the joy of the Lord is our strength. So we looked up to the Lord. So many times things looked bad and then got better. But this time around, my dearest, what happened? I stood by you for several minutes expecting a sign that would assure me that you are going to bounce back. But no, what I got from the doctor was the end had come. Yes, the end on earth may have come, but I believe with all my heart that you are with the Lord. To say I miss you will be to say I miss you dearly is an understatement, and I'm dreading the loneliness already staring me in the face. But I am happy for you, because being with the Lord is far better. I believe therefore that I will see you again as well as the saints who have gone ahead. But for now, my beloved, strong and humble husband, I say au revoir. Sleep, sleep peacefully in the, Lord, in the Lord till we meet again. Amen. In our tributes, we are all going to uh, summarize our tributes because, um, because of time constraints and also um, COVID constraints. Okay. Um, I've written, how does one write an adequate tribute to a father who lived beyond his 101st year? One who gave you his name, from my original birth certificate read, Neil Kain Odibai Evans Anfon, but he added Emmanuel a few days later. Of course, growing up, your father is your tower of strength, so, so you listen to him. And one of my uh, favorite and earliest memories was, um, I was going to boarding school, I was nine years old, and we had to drive from Edinburgh down to London and beyond. At that time, there was no motorway or anything like that. And it was a 12 hour journey. So it mainly consisted of me listening to him. And I remember 
one of the things he said, and which I confessed to him many years later that I didn't always keep, was he told me, Kano, which means in Ghana, don't fight. But when you go to boarding school, how can you not fight? I also remember as he was driving, as we were coming around a bend, any bend, he would, he would honk his horn, and I asked him why. And he said, well, that was to warn oncoming drivers. So, so you needed to, so when I started driving about a decade or so later, I always doing the same thing. Daddy had a seriously sweet tooth, which I think he's passed down in varying degrees to all of us, but I think I had it worst. And very often some of his friends would ask him, how come he still had a sweet tooth? And his standard answer was, I inherited it from Neokai. There are also a number of occasions when I, I learned the hard way that father knows best. Many years after that uh, drive down to Edinburgh, I was about 12 years old, and he came to the parents' day uh, <coughs> celebration of the school, and by that time I was in the cricket team, and I was, we were playing the parents. And he came to watch, and just as I was about to bat, the bell went for lunch. And I was looking forward to lunch, but he kept on saying, no, 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 well, your innings, I, you have to save yourself for your innings. And I was getting really angry. So uh, after lunch, I went in and batted, and I made a, a very good score. And uh, he couldn't resist the victory lap. So aren't you happy you didn't have lunch? As a grandparent, he was the definition of a doting grandfather. And both of my daughters and his other grandchildren received dollops of it. On one visit to visit us in Atlanta when Maya was about two, I noticed on one occasion that after my back was turned, her grandfather breaking some Kit Kat for her after I had told her she'd had enough chocolate. So for the remainder of that visit, I was completely bypassed where chocolate was concerned. And at the end of the visit, Maya mysteriously received a t-shirt which said, when daddy says no, ask grandpa. In more recent years, he loved going through a large suitcase which we have with pictures from, I don't know, all the way back. And like a lot of people have said, he had a great memory. He could remember exactly what was going on. And I remember and there's one particular picture which showed him about a year before he started his medical studies in the Gold Coast, when he was in the Gold Coast. A year, a year and a half later, after he traveled to Scotland, most of his hair started receding. And um, I told him that, well, that was fine, since I was his son and hair. It has fallen on me more and more in recent times to write tributes to fallen friends and family, sometimes on behalf of this family. One of the final phone conversations I had with him before I arrived six weeks ago occurred after I had written one for my very dear friend who had passed away and who daddy also knew very well. And he said he feels that I'll be writing his own tribute very soon. But his, his humor remained intact and his mind sharp right to the end. Years before, days before he left us, another bosom friend of mine, knowing his weakness and regularly brought him chocolate ice cream and chocolate cake. And he came to visit. When I told daddy who had arrived to see him, not sure whether he knew what I was, you know, whether he could make out what I was saying, there was a hint of a smile and he said very softly, because he could hardly speak, and he was hardly eating. Then he said, ah, we have ice cream and chocolate in the house. Some of the final words he uttered were a few days before he left, when we were trying to coax him to take some medicine, which he was reluctant to do. And he kept shaking his head 
until he said softly in Ghana, you can a joe. It's too bitter. Maybe it was bitter then for him, but his life made our lives so much sweeter. May the angels welcome my father into paradise. Dearest Daddy, Dearest Daddy, where do I begin? The memories are so many. My daddy, to whom I used to run and meet in the driveway at number one Patasi Road in Kumasi, and tell all that had gone on during your absence, and for which I was nicknamed Daily Graphic. You were a truly caring father. I remember the night when I was so ill, and you put up a camp bed in your bedroom and sponged me down yourself. You were then the Vice Chancellor of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology, and you must have come home tired, but you made sure that I was out of danger. We never heard you speak ill of people or look down on anyone. You saw all human beings as equal, and you showed us this in so many ways. When the ban on political parties was lifted in the early 1970s, and political parties were formed, there was a lot of campaigning going on and songs composed. One popular song in Kumasi at that time was rather derogatory about the leader from a particular ethnic group. As children, we happily sang the song in the car one afternoon when we were in town. When you heard the words, you gave us a really good blasting and told us never to sing such songs again. You taught us that you were not going to tolerate any ethnic bigotry or any type of disparaging language. I have never forgotten that. I got to know recently that the cobbler on the KNUST campus used to say that even the vice chancellor reverses and gives me a lift when he sees me walking. That was you. I learned from you to live within my means and to resist the temptation to be what I am not, as you did. I believe God himself arranged for us to have fond memories of your last night on earth when quite unplanned and spontaneously, we sang, prayed, and played your favorite music. When you lifted your hands and started clapping, had you started on your journey? Had you started worshiping the Lord your God? We are grateful for the memories, and we are grateful to God to have had you as a father. We will live to make you proud and honor your memory by the grace of God. May the Lord keep you in his bosom till we meet again. Love always, Rachel. It has been said that a young boy's first hero is his father, and that was certainly true for me. I used to admire the effortless swag of the guy in the white coat and the way he was held in deference by all who he came into contact with. So is it any wonder that my first ambition was to be a doctor, and my vocabulary was soon enriched with words like uh, serratus anterior and latissimus dorsi. The doctors will, will know what I mean. But I have memories of him showing me how to do the little things, tying a tie, my shoelaces, helping me with arithmetic, and other little things that stick in a young boy's memory. Soft-spoken, but very firm when necessary. My siblings will tell you that I, more than any of them, was probably on the, the receiving end of, of that discipline. But perhaps the greatest example he set for us was his quiet dignity and steadfast integrity, the way he was able to interact cordially with everyone. No matter your status in life or society, he treated everyone just the same. He had a listening ear and a ready smile. In fact, he was living proof that a good name is better than riches. 
In latter years, the relationship was reversed, and I had the privilege to reciprocate a lot of the love and care that had been lavished on me as a young boy. Sunday mornings were unique after he fell ill. And after a week of bed baths, Sunday mornings, I'd wheel him into the shower and he would frolic like a young man. And afterwards, we'd do the shave and hair trim. Yes, he did have hair to trim. I, I see some incredulous e expressions. But after that was our time together. I would wheel him out onto the terrace and he would enjoy the sunshine with his glass of, he had a choice of drinks. And uh, whatever he wanted to do, listen to music, you know, just sit and talk as he would draw from his phenomenal memory and give advice and encouragement. And I acquired a whole new set of skills. I don't There's only one answer to that. And I remember one Sunday morning after we'd had one of these, uh, we'd agree to disagree, let, let me put it that way. who loved his God, his family, and his country. I could not have asked for. what my family and daddy in particular would call me. My earliest recollections of life and of daddy in general were on the campus of USD in Kumasi. And I'm convinced Thank you. 
When the political turmoil after the December 31st, 1981 coup significantly impacted the universities. I therefore find myself leaving home to enroll in university in North Carolina in the U.S. And so started a phase of my life away from home. Which lasted for a little over three decades. All your encouragement and guidance when Tioka and I got married, and your first visit soon after to us in Maryland. Where you were introduced to your first grandson, CJ. members of the Canadian community in Washington, D.C. area, some of whom knew you personally, and many of whom knew of you, and spoke very highly of you. They were equally proud of their grandpa and their grandfather, name, even though they were thousands of, thousands of miles away from Ghana. Your example of dedication to and service to your country is one of the main reasons why we elected to return home. After a considerable time away, some asked why I would leave a relatively good job with what many consider the preeminent development institution in the world and come back home. Because it is now an opportunity for me to give back for being blessed with so much. You often say Ghana must be built by Ghanaians. There's also a chance to get me when I first started with you. I left as a boy. Returned a man. God being so good, he kept you. So I said, I was able to engage you fully after my return. In fact, the things were all intact. You were very lucid. I mean, you gave you clearly for just a couple of days before you passed. We need to discuss different topics such as economic development, components of the national budget, agricultural supply chain, public universities, and the need for strong and independent but accountable academia. The knowledge of those areas never ceases to amaze You will miss our weekly bargaining sessions. You need to go ahead responsibly for your hair. I did your facial hair, your hair and mustache, to style you into an Abrantia doctor. Well, that's just for a video call with your grandkids. You did look good, you were very young. You could easily have passed for 75 years old, but one of them. I remember another story you told about meeting someone, probably the late 1990s or early 2000s, who asked if you were the son of your best friend who had operated on you. To which 
she saw the gentleman, and he was looking at the only doctor that sat from your aware of, who got an update on the thing. The gentleman was shocked. I couldn't believe how you should be there. Daddy, you often told me that you're going to do so much for you. But whatever we did was because we deserved it. And we wish we had done that. And it fails in comparison to what you've done for me. I've been privileged and honored. Have you as a father? And tell my children. And if I can be half the man you were, I'll be happy. The legacy will be very long. So we'll talk down from the man above, in his infinite wisdom, has all you home. The long and purposeful travels of this earth have undoubtedly led you to rest peacefully in the arms of the Almighty, your Charlie Boy. I read this tribute on behalf of the moderator of General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church of Ghana and the entire Presbyterian Church of Ghana family. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. The late Dr. Ivan Zanfom was born and raised by Presbyterian parents and had his basic education and training in the Presbyterian schools at Osu, where he was raised and where, as he said, his character formation started seriously. In his home and schools, the then young Ivan Zanfom imbibed the ethos of Presbyterianism, particularly hard work, discipline, perseverance, integrity, sound moral principles, godly leadership, and service to God and mankind. He was a staunch member of the Presbyterian Church of Ghana, to which he provided several decades of dedicated service, especially to the Osu Ebenezer Presbyterian Congregation. At Osu, the late Dr. Anfom was elected and served on many important church committees and boards, not as a member, but very often as chair. He was elected presbyter in 1978 and served on session for 20 years. He was senior presbyter for eight out of those 20 years. Our most respected leader had other accomplishments to his credit. He was instrumental in setting up the scholarship fund of the Osu Ebenezer Presbyterian Church, by which the church assisted in the education of promising children of church members. Here also, he served tirelessly for 20 years as the first chair of the Board of Trustees of the Fund. It is gratifying to note that many former beneficiaries of the Fund are now successful professionals, including medical doctors, engineers, lawyers, and academics who are making invaluable contributions to the development of this country. What is more, the Fund still exists and is fulfilling the magnificent objectives of its founders. At the national church level, Dr. Ivan Zampum was national chairman of the President Church of Ghana's Committee on Interchurch and Ecumenical Relations for 15 years. That is from 1983 to 1998. Here again, he discharged his duties with great diligence. In his service to the church, he did not shy away from engaging with the leadership on matters over which he felt the best interests of the church were at stake. For 16 years, that is from 1986 to 2002, Dr. Anfom served as the founding chairman of the Board of Trustees of the Akrofi Christala Center for Mission Research and Applied Theology, Akropong, presently known as the Akrofi Christala Institute of Theology, Mission, and Culture. 
Here too, he devoted his energies and wisdom to the promotion of African Christian scholarship. In the early stages, the board held its meetings in Dr. Evans Hanform's home as he provided effective leadership in the deliberations of the board. He was an illustrious Ghanaian with many achievements, a renowned medical doctor and skillful surgeon, an educationist, a reputable administrator, a quintessential public servant, an elder statesman, and a devout Christian. As the nation and the people of Ghana bid him farewell, the Presbyterian Church of Ghana would like to place on record its deepest appreciation and gratitude for the godly leadership qualities that he showed and his great contribution to the development and progress of the church. Parting with loved ones and highly respected leaders is not easy. And the President Church of Ghana truly feels lost with Dr. Anforms. However, we are still encouraged by his devoted services and bold actions, his honesty, his vision, and his steadfast faith in the Lord, his creator. For the invaluable contributions he made in various capacities to the well-being of humanity, the development of this nation, and the progress of the Presbyterian Church of Ghana, the name of Dr. Emmanuel Evans Anfum will never be forgotten. His labors shall not be in vain. On behalf of the moderator of General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church of Ghana, the entire leadership and members of the Presbyterian Church of Ghana, we bid you farewell. Chulokwapa, Yawajuba, Wa, no Johi, Yenuncholemi. Amen. There will be a slight change in the program. We shall sing the first stanza only of the next hymn, Great is Thy Faithfulness. And after that, we shall listen to a tribute from the President of the Republic of Ghana. citizen and outstanding patriot, Dr. Evan Abfon's contribution to the development and growth of our nation is inestimable. He will be long remembered by present and succeeding generations of Ghanaians who will be inspired by his life of integrity and service to society and country. I remain indebted by standing in for my late father-in-law, 
Mr. Justice J. F. Griffith Randolph, and my marriage to his niece, Rebecca. May God bless him and give him a peaceful place of abode in his bosom until the last day of the resurrection, when we shall all meet again. Amen. Amen. We shall now listen to the next set of tributes from OAA, KNUST, Ghana Academy of Arts and Sciences. Akura Dr. Emmanuel Evans Anfum, physician, vice chancellor, public servant, and keen sportsman, was a member of the 1938 year group. He was probably the last member of the group to depart this world. He gained admission to Form 3 at Achimota College, as it was, or Prince of Wales College, as it was then known, from Usu Salem School. He came to Form 3 because that was where the four-year secondary program began and continued through to the sixth form. On arriving at Achimota School on 11th January 1935, he was assigned to Levinston House. He was awed by the school and was very eager to learn new things. He did chores in the house like everyone else and took to gardening too. Accra Evans Anfum took his academic work seriously and was particularly intrigued by Latin. It helped him to build his English vocabulary and understand better later medical technology in his studies, especially when learning human anatomy. Even though his studies were science biased, Accra Evans Anfum was interested in art, especially drawing. One of his teachers, Mr. George Hood, who produced operators that the school became famous for, used him to illustrate costumes for various plays and operas. He indeed won prizes for arts on different occasions. Reading was his favorite pastime, and he read widely. He did not stick to academic work only, but participated in extracurricular activities, including participation in school plays and operas and also in tribal dancing and sports. He joined the student Christian movement following his well-grounded Christian upbringing. Accra Evans Anfum was indeed an all-rounder. He remained a keen sportsman, having played football and volleyball at Usu Salem. He learned to play hockey at Achimoto and became so good at it that he represented Livingston House at school competitions, as well as being on the school team and winning competitions for the school. The bond between Accra Evans Anfum and Achimota School was never broken. Throughout his life, he portrayed his Achimota spirit in many different ways. All his sons attended Achimota School and were all artistically inclined. The interior of his home was decorated with memorabilia from Achimota School. He attended at school and alumni events as much as he could. He was always guaranteed a front row seat. When he became physically challenged, 
room was made to accommodate him in his wheelchair. He did not miss out on events like the Founders Day Deba and the Festival of Nine Lessons and Carols. His love for music stayed with him long after he had left Achimoto School. When he became too frail to get around, he invited the OAA choir, a choir of members of the association, for an evening of songs. This turned out to be a most delightful event. Accra Emmanuel Ivan Sanfum was part of a generation of people who were among the first beneficiaries of public secular secondary education delivered with quality in mind. They knew they had been admitted to the school to prepare them for a, future, a life of public service. They also knew that they were privileged and that they would have to pay back later through service to country. A private Sanfum excelled at giving back to his country. He worked under difficult conditions throughout Ghana for little recognition. He provided leadership in both the health and education sectors. He made a very big difference to the community in these areas. Indeed, his autobiography, To the Thirsty Land, provides a comprehensive account of how service was rendered at different places and at different points in time. It was true service to the country. On the occasion of Accra Emmanuel Ivan Sanfum's centenary birthday, the OAA was very proud to join him in celebration. In the citation presented to him, the OAA noted, and I quote, you are a true and worthy example of living waters to a thirsty land, unquote. The citation mentioned how proud all oppressed were of the sacrifices he made for his country. It was further noted that his life had been a shining example to younger generations. On this occasion, as we mourn the departure of Accra, Dr. Emmanuel Ivan Sanfum, the old Achimutan Association records its appreciation of a life very well lived to make Achimutan School proud. Accra, Emmanuel Ivan Sanfum, you came you played your part, and you have exited the stage of this world. May the good Lord grant you eternal rest. Amen. We like to sing the school song, all Achimutas may stand. From Gambaga to Accra, one go. From Gambaga to Accra, from we are so to Kitra, we are brothers and our mother is of school. She will guide us all in need, so to learn that. When you're up against the struggle That shatters all your dreams And your hopes have been cruelly crushed 
by Satan's manifest schemes, and you feel the urge within you to submit to every fear. Don't let the faith you're standing in seem to disappear. Praise the Lord. He can work through those who praise Him. Praise the Lord. For our God in heaven's praise. Praise the Lord. For the chains that seem to bind you serve only to remind you they brought powers behind you when you pray. Satan is a liar, and he wants to make us think that we are paupers, when he knows himself we're children of the king. So lift up the mighty shield of faith, for the battle must be won. We know that Jesus Christ is risen, so the work's already done. Praise the Lord, he can work. the Lord, for the chains that seem to bind you, serve only to remind you, they drop powerless behind you, when you praise Him, praise the Lord. Only to remind you the day the powerless behind you when you praise him, praise him, when you praise him, when you praise him, when you We shall now listen to the sermon to be preached by the moderator of the General Assembly of the Presbyterian Church of Ghana, the Right Reverend Professor Joseph Ubri Yebua. Who is also the chairperson Also, as a church, say a very big thank you to His Excellency the President of the Republic for making this uh, national funeral. Papa Nana, His Excellency.
Thank you very much. God bless you. I, I preach on the theme this morning. But God will help you. And Israel said to Joseph, I am dying, but God will help you. I preach on the theme, God help our homeland Ghana. Let us pray. I pray, O oh God, that the word of my mouth and the later became the prime minister of Egypt during the period of severe famine in the Middle East. Joseph eventually got Pharaoh to agree to bring Joseph's family to live in Egypt. The minister had two sons. One was called Manasseh, and the other was Ephraim. When Joseph's father, Jacob, was very old, and was about dying. Joseph brought his two sons for grandpa to bless them. The act of blessing in ancient Near East was not just verbal, but was both prophetic and hereditary carrying with it perpetual inheritance times when he was blessing the two children. Now, when he was blessing the two children, I thought that the father had made a mistake and wanted to switch the hands. But then the father refused and said to the son, I know, my son, I know. It was after blessing his two grandchildren that Jacob said to Joseph, the text we have read, Behold, I am dying. My God will be with you, and God will help you, and bring you back to the land of your fathers. And here Dr. Ivan Samson saying the same thing. I am dead, but God will help them. Jacob was 147 years old when he died. The Taiwan was 101 years old when he died. It might interest you to know that when I was praying and thinking about the text to use, and I realized that the Taiwan had crossed 100 years, I was looking for Bible figures that had crossed 100 years. If I count to mention, I count to mention those who are across 900 years, you might not have believed it. So I said, okay, let me come down to Jacob's time. And he was 147 years old when he died. Now, for someone born over 101 years ago, I believe his eyes had really seen several things, and his ears had heard great things. Papa Ibrahim Fum was born, and he was there even before Toyota. Sakichi founded the Toyota company. So when he was growing up, there was no Toyota in Lucas. When he was growing up, it is more likely that he would have seen cars like Opel Capitan, Opel Records, and not several of the modern ones that we use now. And as has been said, there were no personal computers at that time. 
It's more likely when he was in school, he used, uh, he did not use ballpoint pen. He may have used what we call stick pen. He was there when Frederick Gordon Gettysburg was governor from 1919 to 1927. He was there when Bill Maxwell was governor in 1927. He was there when Alexander Slater was governor from 1927 to 1932. He was there when Geoffrey Northcote was governor from 1932 to 1934. He was there when Alan Hodgson was governor from 1934. To 1941. He was there when Alan Banks was president, was governor from 1942 to 1947. His eyes saw Roman. He went with him. He saw all the military leaders who came afterwards. He then also saw the elected leaders. His eyes saw Kay Bilya, the relative of Pilar Liban, Gary John Rowan, President John Adetun Kufo, John Atam Leo, John Mahama, and his eyes saw His Excellency Nana Abedan Batufar. His eyes saw the unfolding of Ghana. And he played key roles in several ways to help develop Ghana into a nation. His eyes, his eyes saw it when when Tinaba was tablet. Now when I say Tinaba to my children, they don't know what it is. His eyes saw a loaf of bread. It was so complete. I do recall when my senior brother that I came after, when we were younger, he said that when he grows up, he will buy a car. And one thing he will do in a car with a car is that he will buy loaves of bread up to one pound and store them at the back of his car for everybody to see. And now I was I've been thinking about a loaf of bread for one pound, what that will do. His eyes saw the Second World War from 1939 to 1945. His eyes saw the Burma War from 1941 to, to 1945. We are grateful to God Almighty for such great people. You know, there are certain things that make a nation great and strong, as written in our national anthem. One of them is a desire to develop itself. The Ephesians chapter 4 verse 8 says that we must think of things that are true, things that are lovely, things that are good, things that are right, things that are excellent, things that Medicine. He said that he was one of the best doctors that you could ever know. I do remember that when he was at the University of Vice Chancellor, I was a student in a secondary school. And all over to Marcy, he couldn't help but hear the name of that he was out from Vice Chancellor. He was somebody who had moral uprightness, and this is something that every nation would need to move on to the world. You know, the scriptures teach that righteousness is also an issue. But sin is a reproach. Proverbs chapter 14, verse 34. And here we got a man who exhibited this in his life. He was such a God fearing person that he could not even bring corruption near him. I mean, this person that we are celebrating, he reminds us of the that he did. He spent most of his life with the church. He was a lay preacher. He was a senior presbyter. He knew me plays as Kosu. Now, in the Presbyterian Church of Ghana, when we say you are a Presbyter at Osu, we call small, small local. Osu is uh, perhaps the first place that the missionaries ever came to. 
And for you to become a predator there is not a small matter. If you become the senior predator at the zoo, means that you really invite what you call the predatorian spirit, the predatorian discipline. And here you got a man who was a good exemplar of the predatorian spirit, of the predatorian discipline, and the predator did not have any problem in asking him to represent us at international events. We are very grateful to God for such a person. He was no state, no. But at least, if you're thinking about moral uprightness, you would point to the final answer. And we are grateful to God for that. The fourth thing that really exalts a nation is sacrificial leadership. The scriptures say that good name is better than riches. And I'm glad that when one of the people who read the tributes came and said that, and put in the same words, Good name is better than riches, in reference to the Taiwan Africa. I was so much excited that we had a generation in this country for whom a verse like that was so important. Good name is better than riches. I pray to God that this will be a social value for all of us. Because it looks like nowadays people have turned the Bible verse around. Even some preachers have turned the Bible verse around. As if riches is better than a good name. Scriptures teach that good name is better than Riches. Not that riches is a bad thing, but then we should do things that will bring good name to us and to the society. It is so important, and I have to do even think of a situation some young children, some teenagers, we can go and kill a 14 year old just to get more money. And I sometimes I sit there and I pray to God that what are such people who promise these children money, whether they are preachers or they are fetish priests, it's not the same spirit sometimes. They will all be arrested. I pray to God they should be arrested. Perhaps, if, for me, my, my, my point is, if you can conjure more money to come, which is not going to be able to do it, it is not going to be able to do it. May God grant us grace to be able to pass on this important value to our children that could be better than riches. And this is something that I'm going to ask to divide, and we are grateful. He spent most of his life. We will tell people that we came to serve and not to be served. May God raise for us more events and forms in this country. And then again, patriotism. For a country to move on, people must be patriotic. And sometimes I ask myself, I, I, I do recollect when I was young and I was growing up and Kwame Nkrumah was the president. I do recall sometimes in the evening, you will hear the national anthem, and wherever you are, you will have to stand up straight. Cars will even stop on the street when the national anthem is being played. May we perhaps get back to this, because these days there are too many voices that are insulting people. They insult church leaders. They, they insult even le political leaders. They insult people who are far, far, far older than them, and they don't seem to care. And they, they, I don't know how this is categorized. This is a bane in this society, and I pray to God that we will learn from people who have gone ahead of us, like Papa Ivan's Anfum, to learn to be patriotic. He sacrificed so much that even when he could get more money by working abroad, he said, I'll go back home and help. Even when he was transferred to Tamale and he, he had a challenge, he said it was too far away, and they challenged him and they said to him, the doctor said to him, far away from where? When he says some, some places far away, it all depends on where you are standing. And it couldn't be that far away from a sick patient. So as a Christian, he humbly went. And he really was a blessing to many people. And thank God he even found a wife there. And then the last one I want to mention is hard work. And here we are talking about people who really believed in hard work. People who committed themselves to hard work. Oh, meaning, eh? We are living in a generation now that it looks like people don't seem to understand the importance of hard work. Some people think that money should be able should come anyhow, can conjure it. You either conjure it or you cast lottery um, or you do betting and the money can just come. If we have a nation that does not teach people that hard work is very important, we are in trouble. You know, Psalm 90, verse 17 says, Let the favor of the Lord, our God, be upon us and establish the work of our hands upon us. 
Yes, establish the work of our hands. That is to say, God blesses the work of our hands. God blesses the work of our hands. God blesses the work of our hands. And I pray to God that nobody will just sit there without anything doing and say, God bless me. That's a bad prayer. We thank God for people like Dr. Ivan Anfum, who worked so hard to help this country to be where it is now. May God give our generation that grace so that we can work harder for the next generation, so we can leave something better for the next generation. Psalm 128 verse 2 says, you shall eat the labor of your hands. And again in Galatians chapter 6 verse 7, whatever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. If we, we sow laziness in this country, we will reap laziness. We will not get anywhere. If we sow a spirit where money can come anyhow without hard work, our future will be doomed. May God give us grace. May God help our homeland, Ghana. May God give us more Ivan's Anfums in this country. Ivan's Anfums who believe in Ghana that we can become a first world nation who have a burning desire to sacrifice all that they've got for a better Ghana. May God give us more Ivan's Anfums who believe in moral uprightness as the key to good leadership and who believe in scientific and technological innovations as the key to serious development of our nation. May God help our homeland, Ghana, by giving us more events and forms. Now to the family and to the faithful, to the widow and the bereaved family, I pray that you take heart because for us as believers, death is not the end of life, but the beginning of eternity. Jesus said, I go and prepare a place for you, so that where I am, you may be also. My brothers and sisters, heaven is real. Heaven is real. If you, if you develop any theory or philosophy that thinks that it is just something used to trick people, you die and see. If you like, die and see. And when you die and you go, don't say we didn't tell you. Heaven is real. This world, we are passing through. We are passing through this world. There's a hymn that says that the hill of Zion yields a thousand sacred sweets. We are marching through Emmanuel's grounds or walk the golden streets. We are marching to Zion. We are marching to Zion, beautiful, beautiful Zion. We are marching to Zion, the beautiful city of God. Let's all be ready so that any time the Lord calls us, whether we are over 100 years, or we are 70 years old, or we are 40 years old, or we are 30 or 40, 14 years old. Anytime the Lord calls us, let us be ready. Let us be ready and rush to, to meet our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. I do recollect that after some time, Papa Ivan Anfum couldn't go to church because of health. And so we would go home and give him communion. The church would go home, give him communion, and pray with him sing and pray with him. But then there was also an annual event on his birthday where we'd go and then give communion to him. That one, the leadership from the moderatorship would go, and any time we would go, he would have gathered several of his family members. And the first time that I went, I was surprised because I saw MPP leadership, NDC leadership, presidents, past and present, there sitting there, and we all had communion together. And I was giving the communion and I was watching and I said, ah, so why do people sit back and fight? Dr. Ivan Anfum was able to gather them all in his home. And it was such a wonderful scenery every time that we went there to celebrate the goodness of God during his birthday. I want to leave you with Psalm 46, verse 1 to 5. Psalm 46, verse 1 to 5. And this is for the family. If you are not a member of the family, you can choose not to listen to this part. Psalm 46, verse 1 to 5. It says that God is our refuge and strength. May God be your refuge and your strength. A very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. Even though the earth be removed, and though the mountains be carried into the midst of the sea, though its waters roar and be troubled, though the mountains shake with its swelling, there is a river. I said there is a river. 
whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy place of the tabernacle of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God shall help her, just as the break of dawn. God shall help us. God shall help Ghana. God shall help their family. May you never be shaken nor moved, even when life's circumstances seem to turn against you. May you keep pressing on in life, even in the midst of all odds. For God will never leave you nor forsake you. He will help you. God help Ghana. Whether you are on the top of the mountain or struggling in the valley in your life, God is there to help you. May we always position ourselves as a nation to receive the help of God by working hard, by praying to God, by making sure that we commit ourselves to scientific and technological innovation, by making sure there is moral integrity and that this is a social value that we take seriously and having a desire to develop and sacrificing our hearts for God and for our country. May God help us and strengthen us. If you go home and you, don't, you, you forget anything, remember I preached on the theme, God help our homeland Ghana. If we position ourselves well, God will help us and bless us. May he give us more events and bless us in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us pray. Almighty God, we are grateful to you for this, your word that has come to us. We pray for grace to be able to trust you, to strengthen us, to be a blessing to our nation and the generations to come. In Jesus' name, amen. Shall we please all stand and affirm our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed, which says, I believe in God the Father Almighty. Was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. Amen. Please be seated. Thank you. Respectfully, I would ask you to stand for us to observe a minute silence as we remember this great and illustrious son of the land. Please let us rise. And let us observe the minute silence. Let us pray. Most holy and merciful God, the refuge and strength of those who put their trust in you, we thank you for the salvation that you have brought to us in Jesus Christ our Lord, who by his life has spoken to us the word of life. By his death has destroyed the power of death 
and by his glorious resurrection has opened the kingdom of heaven to all believers. Oh Lord, we thank you. Thank you. Thank you for the great multitude that no man can number whom you have received into your eternal joy. We praise you, Lord, that you have forgiven them all their sins and that they dwell with you beyond evil and sorrow forever. We thank you also for all to whom, amid the trials of this mortal life, you do give by your Holy Spirit the faith that overcomes the world, who have peace in you and rejoice in the hope of your glory through Jesus Christ our Lord. O God, our strength and our redeemer, giver of life and conqueror of death, we worship you in this hour of sorrow with humbled hearts. With faith in your perfect mercy and wisdom, we commit our dear father, your servant, Dr. Emmanuel Evans Amfo, to your holy keeping. We praise you for all your loving kindness to him throughout the days of his earthly life and for all that he was by nature and by grace to those who loved him and to the church of Jesus Christ. And now we bless your holy name, that for him all sickness and sorrow are ended, and death itself is past, and that he has entered into the rest that remains for your people. Keep us, we beseech you, in everlasting fellowship with your church triumphant, that we may rejoice together in your presence both now and evermore. Father of mercies and God of all comfort, look down in tender love and pity, we beseech you, upon your servants who mourn. So that while they sorrow, they may remember all your mercies, your promises, and your love in Jesus Christ, and yield themselves into your hands to be taught and disciplined by you. Fill their desolate hands, hearts with love, that they may cleave more closely to you, who brings life out of death, and who can turn their grief into eternal joy. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please be seated. It is time to show our love and we would invite the police band to lead us as we take the offerings.
let us pray as we dedicate our offerings. Eternal God, we thank you in Jesus' name for this opportunity. Opportunity to give, to support your people, O oh God, who mourn at a time like this. We thank you because you are the one who taught us to give. And so we present these our offerings and indeed ourselves to you. And pray that Lord you receive these gifts and bless them. In Jesus name we pray. Amen. We will take announcements from the family after which we will sing Ebenezer. Your Excellency, Honorable Ministers, Family, our eminent clergy, distinguished ladies and gentlemen, we are now at the wreath laying portion of the service. So, wreath laying. First reef will be laid on behalf of the government and people of Ghana by the President of the Republic, Ex Excellency Nanadu Danka Akufuadu. Next with will be laid on behalf of the family of the late Dr. Emmanuel Evans Anfum by Mrs. Thelma Sakodia Edu.
priest will be led by the widow, Mrs. Elise Ruban Stamford. Next week, we be laid on behalf of the children by Neil Kai Evans Stamford. Church of Ghana by the moderator of the General Assembly of the Christian Church of Ghana, Right Reverend Professor Joseph Kubri of Mountain.
Your Excellency, dearly beloved in the Lord, we shall now take the announcement. The announcement will be given to us by Mr. Charles Evans Amphrey. I make these announcements on behalf of the family. Firstly, we wish to thank His Excellency the President and the Government of Ghana for according Daddy the honor of a state-assisted burial. We also wish to thank all participants particularly the state agencies, state protocol, military police, and all involved in the immense planning and assistance given, and contributions, both financial and in kind. We thank the clergy and the Presbyterian Church of Ghana for their participation and their immense help the choirs, the police band, a big thank you to you as well. Number two, after the service, we will be taking Daddy for a private burial. As you know, in these days, there are limitations on the number of people who can go to the cemetery. The family members who will be going to the cemetery, you have been notified that at the conclusion of the event, uh, please assemble, I'm told, behind me, behind where the clergy and the choirs are, to go on a bus to the cemetery. Respectfully, if you have not been notified, I plead with you not to come to the cemetery. The family would also like to donate the proceeds of the offertory that was just collected to the Presbyterian Church of Ghana. Daddy, as you've heard throughout this service, was a staunch Presbyterian. Uh, it is said that at one time when he was Vice Chancellor at KNUST, Professor Kwapong was Vice Chancellor at the University of Ghana, and Professor E.A. Boating was Vice Chancellor at the University of Cape Coast. All three of them were Presbyterians, and they were dumbed, dubbed the Presbyterian Mafia. We would ask that you remain seated long enough for you to be served with some refreshment packs. Obviously, again, with COVID protocols, we prohibit sit sitting for long, so if you just indulge us and get your pack before you uh, uh, leave the premises. As you exit, Fidelity Bank is also here uh, with a donation table if you are so inclined. There are also online donation options available on the last page of the brochure. There's also a memorial website, Dr. Emmanuel Evans .com, where you can review some of the funeral activities and the events of today. I'd like to thank all of you for coming to help us give Daddy a grand send off. Family, friends, colleagues, associates, it's gratifying to see the impact that he's had. And from the bottom of our hearts, we again thank you for your participation. Pray that you go home safely, and may God bless you all. Thank you. Thank you. We bring the service to an end. We will all sing together Ebenezer, after which the Right Reverend Professor Joseph Obriya Boamante 
moderator of general assembly will pronounce the benediction shall we rise and sing ebenezer do not move until he has made those announcements. Shall we receive the benediction of God Almighty? Unto God's gracious mercies and protection, we commit the body, spirit, and soul of our departed father, Emmanuel Evans Amphum, doctor. Unto God's gracious mercies and protection, we all commit ourselves. Unto God's gracious mercies and protection, I commit you all. Brethren, the Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord God of Israel lift up the light of his countenance upon all of us and give us his peace, his real shalom, and the blessing of God Almighty, who alone is Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, rest and abide with all of us now and evermore. Amen. <laughs>